Welcome to another Bible study. You know, we are so glad to have you here tonight. Brothers and sisters, it's always exciting to me to get into the word of God. You know, the Bible has a way of catering to every one of us, to the young persons in church, to the young in the faith, amen, to the mature saint and to the unsaved. Everyone, there is a word for everyone. So I'm glad that you come out to Bible study tonight, you know. For persons who are really new in the faith, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verse 2, that as newborn babes, we must desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Praise God. For those who are a little bit more mature, amen, the Bible, there is something in the word for you. You know, David said in the Psalm that God must open his eyes that he may see wondrous things from the law. And the scripture contains many truths and many things, many wonderful truths that we can learn. And we learn this by doing Bible study. So I am happy that you are out for Bible study tonight. But if you're here and you're not saved and, you know, or you're here, you've been backslidden, there is a word for you to do as well. For the Bible says in Psalms 119 and verse 9 that how can a young man cleanse his ways? But by taking heed to the word of God. Amen. So the word Bible study is an exciting place for me. Praise God. You know, this year is a special year for us as a church, as an organization. You know, we are celebrating and giving God thanks for 10 years, 10 years. I mean, some places don't last this long. Some business start and in a year they fall. Not that we are a business, but it, it, it's, it's interesting that God has kept us this this far you know we have come this far by faith leaning on the lord so this year you know we'll be having our national convention under the theme hold the fourth jesus is coming i want every saint every person who is watching every person who can make the trip and if you can't who can watch online i want you to mark in your calendar for november 5 to 10 at 53 Mullines Road, you know, we are anticipating having a great time in the presence of the Lord. Praise God. So in light of that, this great event that we are having, amen, we'll be studying a topic for this week and probably next week, the mission-driven church. You know, as we prepare ourselves for a great mission work in our convention, because really mission is the heartbeat of the church. And even as we look forward that God is coming and we are holding the foot that Jesus is coming, amen, it's important that the church realize that at its core, it is missions. So tonight we'll be looking at the topic, the mission-driven church. So we, as we prepare ourselves for a great mission work in our convention, so I want us to just bow our heads tonight as we open in prayer, then we will go straight right into Bible study. Bow your heads tonight as we go into prayer, then Bible study. Great God, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for one more time that we have come to study your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that, amen, that one more time we're able, Lord God, to, to look again into the perfect law of liberty. I pray, God, that you will bless the heart of every person who will hear this study tonight. I pray, God, that you will open our hearts, that we will not just be hearers, oh God, that we will try to apply what we have done. God, you have given us a command that we must go, that we must teach, that we must preach. If right now, God, as we are preparing to go into a great event or a national convention coming up in November. I pray, God, that you will help us, God, to prepare ourselves, to sharpen our swords, to be ready, amen, to witness, to be ready, amen, to win souls, to be ready to embark in this great mission outpouring, this great mission event. Bless every person here. Continue to bless us as a church. And God, I pray that you will be with us tonight as we look into this topic, the mission-driven church. Thank you one more time. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your love. As we look to you, God, who is the author and the finish of our faith. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Praise God. And be blessed tonight by this study in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. We'll be talking about the mission-driven church. Praise God. 
And I'm grateful that God would have us to look on this because this really is the heartbeat of where God wants us to be. Amen. Now, we can all agree, praise God, that there are many purposes of the church that, the, that we have been seen in scripture that has been revealed in the Bible. Praise God. There are many purposes that the Bible speaks about that the church is supposed to do. And as Christians, as members of the church, we are supposed to engage in each of these things. They all play a very important task for us in terms of our development and our growth in the kingdom of God. Amen. I mean, the last subject we dealt with, we dealt with the whole subject of worship. And uh, we know that this is a very important uh, role as it relates to what the church is supposed to do. It is the, one of the greatest purpose for which man was created, and that is to worship God. Amen. But equally, there are other tasks that we are supposed to do. You talk about service, and we talk about service, you talk about service within the body. Amen. Praise God. And therefore, we are supposed to minister to each other's need. We're supposed to be able to look out for each other. We're supposed to be able to uh, look about what is taking place in the body of Christ. Amen. Another important thing is fellowship. Amen. And fellowship has to do with us, how we interact with the body as a whole, not just your local assembly, but, you know, recently you, you had convocation or convention, depends on how you define it. And we, you had support from other uh, churches, and I say other churches, other uh, local assemblies came and they supported you. And we have this all the time where persons come together and we work together uh, in order to, to support, to fellowship. And this is very important in the body. Each one of us need each other to survive. But equally, there's also what is called missions. And I want to just look at a diagram here. We'll see how practically how the, the, the mission-driven church is supposed to operate. One, we have a vertical uh, task, and that is towards God, and uh, we have to worship him. Amen. In a similar way, we have a horizontal task, which is towards the saints, uh, which we call discipleship. And it's interesting that Bishop just mentioned this in his introduction. So we have to do with service and fellowship. But equally, on a horizontal plane, we have evangelism, which has to do with how we deal with members of the body. Praise God. And how we get souls to come into the kingdom of God. So all of these are equally important. We have to ensure that if we are lacking in any one of these areas, praise God, that we find a way to ensure that all of these are equal in terms of how we deal with it. We have to worship God. Amen. We have to be in contact with God. Similar, we have to ensure that we win souls for the kingdom of God. Amen. But in a similar way, while we win souls, we have to ensure that we uh, we have enough things, in the, enough bread in the house so that we can keep those that are there. Amen. Um, and therefore, it's important that all three tasks are important in dealing with the body. God, discipleship, praise God, and evangelism. Praise God. Now, in the, in the secular world, um, there is what is called a mission statement. Are we talking about a mission-driven church? Amen. So in the secular world, there is what is called a mission statement. And what a mission statement is, is the foundation to, to uh, the foundation to, to strategic plan of, of the organization. Um, most major organizations, if not all organizations have their mission statement, something that they, they look forward to, something that they're saying that this is what we're going to work towards, right? So you have a mission statement, you have a vision statement, but the mission statement is very, very important, amen. So what normally happens is that when a company is about to set up, amen, what they will do, they will do what is called a SWOT analysis. And this is very important. Um, what the SWOT analysis does, it looks at the strength, you look at the weakness, you look at the opportunities and the threats, amen, and it, it, it does an analysis, before, and from that analysis, it develops a, a mission statement, and we see this in scripture, this is not something that, that the world come up with, really, we see this principle in scripture, for example, in the book of Nehemiah, uh, we find where Nehemiah, one of Nehemiah's brothers, a guy by the name of Hani, Hanani, um, he came, the Bible said he came from Judah, uh, with some of his brethren, and they, they they came to Nehemiah, who was was practically in Persia, it's the, uh, in Persian um, region at the time. It is obvious that um, Nehemiah didn't grow 
um, in, 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 in Jerusalem, but he was one of the persons who were uh, practically a, a captive in Babylon. And he was one of them who remained in the Persian kingdom after they went back. So if you can remember the history um, the, from the book of Ezra and Ezra and Nehemiah are really one book. So if you remember the history, Ezra was the one, um, Zerubbabel actually first came out when they came out of captivity. Um, Zerubbabel sent them to, and he was able to go on and build the temple. So he established a temple, I mean, that was broken down and he was able to build back that particular temple for the people of God, amen. And then you had Ezra who came after him and Ezra was the one who actually kind of reintroduced um, the whole fellowship, how do you, the whole law and how do you follow the law and so on and so forth. But you know what I found interesting though, was that for about 90 years after the temple was rebuilt, amen, there was no wall around Jerusalem. So when Hanani came to Nehemiah and told him the situation of what was taking place, um, he said, look here, um, the, 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 the Jerusalem is in ruins practically. It's in a, in, a, in a disgraceful state. He said the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates are burnt with fire. And, and I found that a bit interesting because 90 years after the fact, we are realizing that the temple was built, but there was no wall. And I, and I kind of pondered this a bit and I said, God, what, you know? And it, I, I get to realize that the walls actually, and I'm coming back to the SWOT analysis, but the walls represented a sense of security around the people, all right? The walls represented that thing that in ancient times, when the city, when they when they had walls around the city, it speaks to their protection, it speaks to the fact that they had, they could block out the enemy, amen? So I realized that the, if you notice something, you never had Sambalat and Tobias or any much trouble with Zerubbabel or with Ezra. And I'm saying, God, what does this mean? And it simply means this, the enemy is okay with you coming to church as long as you let him in. Let me say that again. So as long as there is no protection around you, as long as you don't guard yourself, you don't build up yourself in the word, you don't build up yourself in the things of God, the enemy is fine. He's fine with you coming to church and jumping and skipping and doing what you're supposed to do. But once there is no wall, once there's no security, he's fine. So there was no trouble to them. Anyway, but I realized something about Nehemiah. He, when he got the news that the, the walls was broken down, it troubled him. And he did something. He, he, he asked um, Artaxerxes, who was the king, to say, he, he actually, he was sad, and Artaxerxes saw him and said, why you look sad? You have never been sad around me, all right? And the king was able to explain to him and say, boy, our, our, our... Nehemiah was able to explain to them, look here, I, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. My, 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 my city is in ruins, praise God. And it so happened that we see what happened. The king allowed him to go back and rebuild his wall. And the first thing he did um, was that he went back to Jerusalem secretly, praise God. And when he went back to Jerusalem secretly, he went there and he analyzed the situation with the wall. And that's what I'm saying. As children of God, we have to realize that the first step um, before we can set up a mission statement, the first step for us to understand what is taking place is for us to analyze the wall, analyze what is taking place in the kingdom. Are you comfortable with what you're seeing? Are you comfortable with uh, of, 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 the, of the progress that you're seeing in, in your local assembly, in the body of Christ today? Amen. Are you, are you, have you had, did your analysis of how secure the wall is? Have you done your analysis of their, are there breaches in the wall? Amen. So in a similar way, Nehemiah was able to go and analyze the thing secretly. So what he did, he did what is called like a simply a SWOT analysis. He looked at the strength. Amen. He looked at the weaknesses. He looked at there was any opportunities and he also examined that there were threats. So when a company was about to establish, praise God, um, anything, they would actually do a SWOT analysis first. And then from the SWOT analysis, they would decide, amen, uh, what can be our mission statement from this? After doing their analysis of what is taking place, they can now look on to say, what can I do? So the mission is important in the church because it answers the following questions. Why does the church exist? Amen. When we do our mission, we are answering the question, why does the church exist? All right. And when we get that, if, if we don't know 
our purpose, then really we are we are we don't really have a goal. We don't know what we're working towards. But when we understand what our purpose is, our mission is, then we can work towards that. Praise God. So our mission simply states three things. One, it, it tells us who we are. Who are we? Praise God. Praise God. Who are you? In the, in, in the scheme of everything, who are you? Then it explains what do we do. And thirdly, it communicates who do we do it for? So these are, the, these are simple things that the mission of the church would answer. Who are we? That it will say, what do we do? And lastly, it comes, who do we do it for? This morning or tonight, I want to say to us that, let us start with that point. Who are we? I need us to understand, brethren, that we are the church. We are the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Amen. That's what the Bible, that's what Paul said to Timothy when he, when he, in 1 Timothy 3, 15, he said, we are the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, it's interesting that the word church there, it comes from a Greek word, ecclesia, all right? And ecclesia really is a compound word or is a two-part word. It comes from a combination of two words. All right. So two words combined together to form, to make one word. And the, the, the two words are combined together is the word ek, meaning out, and kalio, meaning to call. So we are the ecclesia. We are the ones who God has called out. So the Bible says in, in Matthew 16, 18, I say also unto thee, and this is the Bible said they were in um, um, Caesarea Philippi. Amen. And, and you remember the, the question that, that, that Peter asks. Um, who uh, Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Jesus and Peter went on to say that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. We know that scripture carefully. And then Jesus said, flesh and blood had not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. And then Jesus made a statement and says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, this is the first time that we find in the use of the word church in the New Testament. And what was interesting is that the word church, even though when we think about church today, I mean, we think about, uh, probably some of us think about a building. Some of us think about us being called out. But in, the, in that time, in the time of the first century, the church was just a special set of called out people. Um, there were people who were, called from their houses, citizens, just normal citizens. Um, they, they, they were like free citizens. They had they were given certain rights based on the, the Romans and the Greeks. They were Greek, they were given certain rights. And they were called from their homes. They were called from their businesses. They were called from, from everything. And they were given uh, certain uh, privilege that they could speak in consideration of matters and, and public interest. They were able, they were given a lot of power. Um, and, 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 and they were allowed to, to, to do stuff like general election and they, 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 they also assign military officers and they raise funds and they do stuff like um, elect and dismiss magistrates. They did some powerful things, amen. And these were special set of people. They were called out from God. Now, in the case of the church, we are the ecclesia. And I said, God used the same first century Greek word to define who we are. Who are we? We are the church of the living God. What did God do? God called us out. And he did like the ecclesia in the case of the, the Romans and the Greek were they combined together to, to form their own opinion on matters. So they realized what was taking place in their cities and they would discuss about 6,000 people. They would discuss issues and whatever and together a collective voice they would come up with um solutions to fix issues in the case of the church as in the new testament church praise god we are not called out to share our opinion that's not what god called us to do but we are called out to listen to the voice of god and to share the voice of God to a dying world. So who we are, we are the church. Our mission is that we first, first identify who we are. If you don't know who you are, you're going to live beneath that, 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 
privilege. It's like a king acting like a peasant. When you realize that you are special, you are called out, you are, you are called from among them. Praise God. You don't walk the same way. You don't talk the same way. Amen. Your dressing is different. Your speech is different. Your lifestyle is different because you are the ecclesia. You are free agent who is called out by God. Amen. So that you can hear the voice of God and declare the voice of God to a dying world. Praise God. The second question of the mission is what do we do? So the mission of both Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament was one simple thing, and that was to reveal God to the world. We must never forget that. Our mission is that we must reveal God to the world. Now, Paul made a very powerful statement to the church in Corinth. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, for I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Praise God. Our main message as children of God, amen, in this season, in this time, is to preach and to teach Christ and him crucified. It's not to teach our opinion. It's not to teach what we think. Amen. Our mission, what we do is we preach Christ. Let me say that again. We preach and we teach Christ and him crucified. Now, you see, this statement uh, sounds nice to us in this time, but to, to the people back in that time, especially no one of the Corinthian church had a problem with Paul, because to say that you're going to preach Christ and him crucified. I, I preached a message recently. It was like a paradox. What it was, it's like you're, you are declaring a Messiah, praise God, who was crucified. Now, that made no sense to the people of that time. Again, examples. The Greeks, they had many gods. And their gods uh, were seen in different ways, powerful ways. So for example, they had Themis, the great goddess of law and justice. They had Zeus, who was the lightning god. They had Hermes, the winged messenger god. They had Prometheus, the god with the gift of fire to man. Um, they, they, they will talk about the titans and their battles. They will talk about their Olympian gods. They will talk about Apollo, the Greek god of archery, light, poetry, and music. But in contrast to all this excitement and intellect and power. What did Paul say we must preach? What do we preach as the church? The Bible said we preach Christ. We preach deliverance from a person who was born in a manger. We preach deliverance from a person who grew up in Nazareth. And Nazareth was not a nice place, brethren. Nazareth was a ghetto era. We preach Christ, a man who died on a cross in Jerusalem, a man who was placed on Golgotha. It, it, it was called... Uh, uh, in a place called Gotha, a, a, a practically a place of a skull. We preach a crucified Messiah. And I always, and I said this earlier, the crucified, to say a crucified Messiah was a contradiction in terms. It is either he was crucified and defeated or he was a Messiah who was victorious. But as the church of God, what we preach is Christ and him crucified. We must never under underestimate the power of our message. We must never underestimate the power of what God has called us to do. Because guess what? The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the wisdom of God is, or the strength of, or the weakness of God is stronger than men. So what am I saying, brethren? Well, who we are, we are the church. What do we do? We reveal God to this world. And what do we reveal God? We preach Christ and him crucified. And who do we do it for? Now, Israel was to be a witness to the heathen nation among them. So that when God called Abraham and Abraham and Isaac and Isaac and Jacob, eventually we know what happened. They went down into Egypt. They became a nation. God did it for a specific purpose. The purpose was to be a witness to the heathen nations around them. God separated them, amen, and called them to be a witness to the heathen nation. But with the church, it's a little different. The church is to go to the nations as his witness. Let me say that again. Israel was to be a witness to the heathen nations, but the church is to go to the same nation as his witness. Amen. So who we are, we are the church. We are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. Amen. We are the pillar and the ground of truth. What do we do? Our mission is, is, is to, to reveal God to a dying world. And who do we do it for? 
we are to go to the nations as Jesus' witnesses. Not just be a witness, but we are to go directly to them and to be a witness to them. Praise God. So in a simple form, the mission of the church is practically the Great Commission. And when we talk about the Great Commission, we can find it in Matthew 28, we can find it in Mark 16, Luke 24, we can find it in John 20 and Acts 1. All of these give variation of what the, the, the mission is for the church. We can look at the one in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So the mission of God, praise God, the mission God gave to the church comes with a couple of things. When God gave us this mission, God did, not just, God did not just leave us without a witness, but God gave us some things. Just like when I said earlier, when Nehemiah was going to go and build the wall, one of the things that they, the king did, he gave him a letter. Amen. So irrespective of what um, Sambalat and Tobiah said, amen, they could not speak against the king of Persia. Remember, Persia was the, was the superpower of the day. It was first the Babylonians, and then we know the Media Persians took over, and then we know later on was the Grecians, and by the time we came to Jesus, it was the Romans. So during the time of Nehemiah, it was the uh, Persians. I remember Nehemiah had a letter. He, get, he got something from the king, something of power. So even though he was building the wall, and Sambalat and Tobias would say, who gave you this authority to do this? They really could do nothing against it. Really, they could try. The most they could do is to try to discourage them. I mean, which is what the enemy tries to do to us. But he cannot do nothing because guess what? When God gave us this mission, amen, he did not just tell us to do something, but it comes with a couple of things. One, the mission comes with authority. Amen. It comes with an authority. Two, it comes with a reach. Secondly, it comes, or thirdly, it comes with a message. And lastly, it comes with a list of activities that we should do. So God, God, mission that he gave to the church comes with authority, comes with a reach, comes with a message and a list of activities to be done by us. As a mission-driven church, as a mission-driven church, and I'm believing God that we are a mission-driven church, we can examine the mission statement given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at this mission statement and try to do a little analysis of what God is asking us to do. So from scriptures, we're going to observe the extent of our ministry. We're going to extend the message that God has given to us and the activity in which we are to engage in multiple, in the what we call the multiplication process. Praise God. Now, look at this. I want us to understand, brethren, that each mission statement comes with, as I said before, the authority, the extent, the message, and the activity. So in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, Jesus said, make a statement. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. We quote that a while ago, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Now, what is the authority? He said, they've gone and teach all nations, teach them to observe. He gave us all authority. Amen. Matthew 28, verse uh, 18 says, he's going to be with you. All authority was given unto him in heaven and in earth. And therefore, because he has all authority, whatever he sends us with, we can be assured that we have God's backative with us. Amen. What's the extent of this particular uh, reach? all nations so irrespective of where you go praise god we have a reach we can reach all nations what's the message all things jesus had commanded so everything that jesus commanded us to do that is the message we are supposed to baptize we're supposed to preach the gospel we're supposed to preach love we're supposed to, all the things we're supposed to heal we're supposed to all these things that the scripture has commanded us to do amen we, that's the message then what's the activity disciples are supposed to go and baptize and teach in Mark 16, 15, we see a similar result. The Bible says, and he said unto them, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What the authority? The name of Jesus. Amen. And he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the authority, according to Mark, 
is the name of Jesus. If we read the verse above it, it will tell you about at the name of Jesus what will happen. So guess what happened? We are able to go under the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. And when we go in Jesus' name, as the songwriter said, tell me who can stand before us when we go in Jesus' name. Truthfully, the name of Jesus is where the authority lies. That is why, as children of God, we baptize in Jesus' name because that's where the authority lies. What takes then to all the world, to every creature? What's the message? The gospel message. Go to all the world and preach the gospel, the good news, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And what's the activity? Go, preach, heal the sick. So we're going to go, we're going to preach the gospel, we're going to heal the sick. In Luke chapter 24, 46 to 49, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached, what? In his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Amen. And you are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, praise God, until you be endued with power from on high. Again, we are seeing in the book of Luke that the authority is the name, praise God. And what's the extent? All nations, and he told us the starting point to begin at Jerusalem. What's the message? Repentance and forgiveness of sin. Amen. And and and, and now that, that remission of sins there is it can be linked back to the book of Acts. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So Luke was practically complementing uh his writings also in the book of Acts. Amen. So repentance and remission of our forgiveness of sin is the message. Who should do it? And what's the activity? We must preach it, we must proclaim it, and we must be our witness. John 20, verse 21 said, Then said Jesus to them, Again, peace be unto you, as my Father had sent me, even so sent I you. No, what's the authority? We are sent by Jesus, and he was sent by his Father. In a similar way like Jesus was sent, amen, and Jesus had a purpose. As a matter of fact, at one point in time, uh, Jesus knew and understood his mission perfectly. Um, when him say, your mother, your father, seek him. He said, who is my father? Who is my father? He, he has a way of answering the questions. He, he was say, look here, I'm come. He, he, he came with a mission. And the mission was to spread the gospel message. Amen. So what's the extent? The extent of the ministry is the message and the activities are to be the same as Jesus. So we see Jesus doing some things. He went about, he preached, he teach. He baptized, he did all of these things, and that's the same authority and activity that we should do. Acts 1 verse 8 says, power, uh, but he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the world. Amen. What's the authority? The power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we are seeing that, one, through Jesus, we are given our authority. Through Jesus, we have authority through the name. Through Jesus, we have the authority that, 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 that Jesus sent us. And through Jesus, we have the authority that of the power of the Holy Ghost. What's the extent? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. What's the message? Christ. Amen. You shall be receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem. So who is the message? The message is about Christ. And what are we supposed to do? Witness. So as a mission-driven church, praise God, we see where the, the mission, amen, is wrapped up in the, the things that we mentioned. It is wrapped up, praise God, in who we are. It is wrapped up in what we do, and it's wrapped up in who we do it for. Praise God. Now, what happens when we neglect missions? What happens when we, when we realize that we are not doing mission work? You know, there is a saying that says, mission is to the church what wood is to fire. Let me say that again. Mission is to the church what wood is to the fire. And, you know, the scripture is a very powerful book because we see in Proverbs 26, 20, it says, where no wood is, there the fire goes out. In other words, if the church is to, is, is, if, 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 the, if the mission of the church I mean, is not where it's supposed to be. If we are not doing mission, then we must con then we're going to realize that uh, we are not going to get where we're supposed to get. If mission is to the church, what wood is to fire, then we must continue to add fuel to the flame. In other words, if we're going, and you know it too, 
anytime we 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 reach a state in our in our hearts and in our minds amen like the people in Nehemiah again who had a mind to work anytime we get it in our spirit amen that this is the heartbeat of church you're going to see some revival that are going to blow your mind anytime we get it, um anytime we start it's serious not about ourselves but serious about soul winning serious about mission of the church we're going to see some things happening because what we'll be doing brethren is just adding wood to fire amen the holy ghost is the fire the holy ghost is the presence that we need but guess what we need wood to keep the fire burning praise god and therefore that wood is when we begin to go out and do mission work when we begin to witness the people when we begin to tell people about god we're going to see some things happening when we do no mission our fire is extinguished and we do not grow let me say it again Anytime you cease to do mission work, you're going to realize some things happening in your life. One, your fire is not going to be so much hot. You're probably going to have something, but it won't be as hot as you intended it to be. Amen. And secondly, you will not grow as you should. Because I don't know about you, but have you ever noticed that whenever you get um in, get wrapped up, in mission work, until you start doing a lot of witnesses, it have this burn that, that, that is an extra burning in your life. It's like you're on fire for the king. Can you imagine the day the church catch the vision, catch the mission of what we are supposed to do? We're going to see some revivals that will blow our mind. That is one of the reasons, praise God, why people like uh, from the Azusa Street coming down, GT Haywood, these men had so much uh, results because their main aim was mission. Their main aim was to bring the gospel to everybody. Amen. We have somewhat lost. We have become so self-centered, centered on our inside and forget that we are called to be witnesses. Amen. We are called to spread the gospel. So we are supposed to do mission. If we do not know mission, our fire is going to be extinguished and we do not grow. Praise God. No, whenever we as the mission-driven church begin to do mission, we're going to start to see growth in four different areas of our life. And I put these four areas in, in order. In other words, it starts from A all the way, A, B, C, D. It goes to D. And, and, and it, go, it goes in that order. The first growth that we're going to notice is internal growth. As I said earlier, whenever we do mission, it does something for you as an individual. It's like prayer. A lot of people, I was telling a brethren recently, a lot of people pray with the intent of God changing something. But what normally happens when we pray and we begin to pray is that really what prayer does, even though prayer changes things, but what prayer does more powerful is that prayer changes us. Sometimes we pray about some things and God don't really change it. God don't even move it. Amen. But it does something for us. It keeps us in the presence of God. And you cannot be in the presence of God. Amen. And not change. Amen. So what happens when we begin to do mission work is that the first thing begins to happen is that we have internal growth. Internal growth refers to the spiritual growth of the people within the church. If you want to see a growing church, show me a mission-driven church. If you want to see a church that is on fire for the Lord, show me a mission-driven church. It starts with internal growth. And, and, and that's happened to the people in church. When you have people just come to church and sit down on the bench, not doing anything at all, you find that people who are going to slowly fade away. But the moment you get involved in mission work, you're going to realize that it, it starts to have this internal growth. So as I said before, it starts with internal growth. This refers to the spiritual growth of the people, praise God, within the church. Now, it doesn't stop there. When it start to do mission, then it moves from just internal, but it starts to have expansion growth. This is the growth in normal, which occurs when the mission of evangelism is fulfilled by the church. So, this is growth in numbers, which occurs when the mission of evangelism is fulfilled by the church. So apart from internal growth that takes place, amen, which is the first level, me, I grow because I'm doing mission. We realize that the church grows, amen. There is an increase in numbers, amen. So what if the church starts with 10 people and we start to really do mission work, in that slowly time, you might see a hundred. And if those people are serious about God, that's where discipleship comes in, then you realize that the hundred turn a thousand. And if those people are serious, then the thousand turn 10,000. Amen. And we have seen this happening over and over because one, there was internal growth for the people. And because there's internal growth, 
instantly we're going to have expansion growth. Now, there's another level of growth above expansion growth. There's extension growth. Now, this is where the growth when new churches are birthed in a similar culture. So because of that now, the fire is so much, amen, that it might start one place. It might start in Jerusalem, but over a matter of time, because there's internal growth, which goes to expansion growth, there has to be extension growth. So God is going to ensure that the gospel message now doesn't just remain in Jerusalem city, but it goes to Judea and it goes to Samaria and it goes to the uttermost parts of the earth. In the case of the uh, Bethel organization, there probably was one church initially, but eventually we start seeing church at South Temple, we start seeing church at Stony Hill, we start seeing church in Aleppo, we start seeing churches all over the island slowly. Why? Because it started first with internal growth then there was a growth in that assembly but guess what you can't have so much salt people in one place amen so what happened the message start to spread and in a similar culture amen so we start bringing the message now i heard bishop made a statement in convention bring them in grow them out send them out something like that uh, I, I, I think probably that's the essence of what he said. But practically, you have extension growth where now the, the, the message now is reaching all parts of the island. And guess what happened? Because of this extension growth, there is another growth that goes above that, which is called bridging growth. This is growth when the church is now bridged to a different culture altogether. Amen. But guess what? It all starts with the first level, internal growth. You as a saint in God, it starts with you. It starts with you as a local assembly, deciding that you're going to be serious about mission and what it entails. You're going to be a mission-driven church. When you have internal growth, they're going to have expansion growth. They're going to have extension growth. They're going to have bridging growth. And I can tell you something. Bridging growth is not easy. While extension growth is in a similar culture. Bridging growth, you deal with a total different culture. I, I remember, as I said before, when I went to Kenya, amen, and I went to Tanzania, and I saw the different cultures, we had to learn a lot. We had to do a lot of research in terms of how to get into this environment, how to, I remember Bishop telling uh, the conference about his experience of going to Rift Valley and what we had to do. We had to drink the spoiled milk, amen, we, because guess what? It takes a different level of mission, but it starts first with internal growth, Amen. And this is where we want to get. We want to ensure that we grow the body from, from internal. Each person must catch the vision. Each person must understand their role in the kingdom so that we can move from internal straight to bridging. Amen. And I see this happening with Bethel. I'm, I'm happy when I hear about churches growing in uh, Antigua. And I'm, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm looking forward to hearing about churches in Barbados and churches in Trinidad, churches in, in, in Guyana. In other places, this is bridging growth, different culture. But guess what? The mission driven church understands that your growth must take place. Amen. And, 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 and this is very important. Now, there is a very important factor that we must take into consideration whenever we're talking about anything with mission driven. Amen. We talk about growth, but there is something we must never forget as we deal with the whole issue of mission. And that is the role of the Holy Ghost in a mission driven church. The role of the Holy Ghost in a mission-driven church. We are apostolics. We are Pentecostals. We are powerful people, people who rely on the Spirit of God. Amen. So the Holy Spirit is the power behind a mission-driven church. Amen. We don't do these things by ourselves. Amen. We rely on the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, but he shall receive what? Power. That word power there, in, we know in the Greek, speaks to dudamos. Uh, authority, I mean, that uh, it talks, it, it explosive, explosive power that comes when we get the Holy Ghost. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Then you shall be witnesses. Note the order. The Holy Ghost comes first. Then you become a witness, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I love this verse because of a couple of reasons. I mean, number one, Chapter 1 and verse 8 of Acts is the outline for the book. And, 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 and if you really look at it, when Luke, who was a very good writer, amen, one of the best, one of the best New Testament writers, really, amen, in terms of scholars will tell you his Greek was excellent, amen, and, and it was obvious that he was very learned. And when he wrote the book of Acts, he looked being one of the companions of Paul, he knew what was taking place in the mission field. So in chapter 1 and verse 8, 
the, the book of Acts, he gave us the outline for the book from that first chapter. And it also gives us a blueprint for growth for a mission-driven church. It gives us a blueprint for growth as a mission-driven church. Let's just look at the outline first. First of all, it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. So if you look in the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 7, we see mission work being done in the Jerusalem region. Then you go on to say Judea and Samaria. So in Acts chapter 8 now, from chapter 8 to chapter 12, we see the gospel message going to Judea and Samaria. And then so to the uttermost parts of the world, to the end of the world. So from chapter 13 to chapter 28, we see Paul's mission work. So here it is that he gave us the blueprint of the book. But more importantly, he showed us the role of the Holy Ghost in relation to how it grows the church. So the receiving of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost enabled the disciples to become powerful witnesses of the gospel. That was internal growth. Remember, you know, before they were with the Lord, they were going out two by two, so on and so forth. But Jesus made a very powerful statement to them in the book of Luke 24 and verse uh, 47 to 49. He goes to say, tarry in Jerusalem until you be in due with power from an eye. Amen. And he, he clearly told them that, look here, you're going, you're going to start this work, but you're going to start it at Jerusalem. In, in, and the reason why he said that, because he knew that what they were going to come up against, amen, they were going to need him with them. He was with them physically, but now he was going to be in them. So the internal growth started from the day they received the Holy Ghost. So we must grow as individuals, then it will flow from the inside out. Remember I said earlier, it started with internal growth, and it moves all the way to uh, expansion growth and so on and so forth. In a similar way as children of God, amen, we see where Luke was saying that the internal growth started with the disciples at Pentecost. Amen. Now, let us look at seven evidences of spiritual growth. If you want to know if you're growing uh, as an individual internally, you can analyze one of these seven. And I like seven. Seven is, is God's perfect number. So I like to use seven every now and then, right? So first of all, if you want to look at your life and to see if you're really growing as a child of God, amen, and growing internally, remember I said mission work starts with you, amen, starts with you as an individual. Look at these seven things. One, you must have an increase in spiritual knowledge. Do you spend time to study the Bible? Do you spend time to study the word? Amen. Um, do you spend time to, to get into the book? Do you read the Bible at all? You know, some people, they only read the Bible only on a Bible study night or a Sunday morning or whatever, but they really don't have their own individual devotion time. Amen. When you talk about internal growth, it means you know, there's an increase in spiritual knowledge. Secondly, there's a proper application of that knowledge to life and ministry. So when you read the scriptures, you not only just read it for your purpose, but there is a proper application. You now know how to apply this knowledge to your life and to ministry. Certainly, there's a deeper delight in spiritual things. Very important because a lot of people, they read the scriptures, but it don't give them that joy that they should get from reading the scripture. You know, like uh, when God gives you a revelation about something, how sweet that feel. Amen. Because for the first time you're seeing this, you're like, God, this blew my mind. So it speaks to the fact that there's a deeper delight. You want to know what the scripture is about. There is a deep desire for the things of God. Then second, then fourthly, there's a great love for God and for others. When you realize that your love for people, irrespective of what they do to you, irrespective of how they treat you, amen, you still love them. It means that you're growing. There's a development of Christ-like spiritual qualities. You start developing spiritual fruit. And that fruits, a lot of people say fruit, but it's really the fruit of the spirit. So the fruit of the spirit is being developed in your life. There's an increase in desire and ability to share the gospel with others. So the moment you, you start having internal growth, you're going to realize that there is this thing burning. It's like Jeremiah, even though they, 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 they wanted to him to stop, even though there were no converts, even, there was this thing that was burning inside of him. The Bible said it was like fire shut up within his bones. There's a desire to, to uh, and not only that desire, but there's also an ability to share the gospel with others. Now, this desire comes from you knowing the word, but this ability comes from you also knowing the word. Because imagine um, you going before somebody to spread the gospel and you don't know nothing about the gospel. There's a problem. So 
it, all of these have to be involved. Then there's a development and effective use of spiritual gifts where God allows you. Now, when you're doing your witnessing, God can give you a word of wisdom and God can give you a word of knowledge. Amen. And God can give you the discerning of spirits. And discerning of spirits is not discerning people's lives, brethren. Discerning of spirits is discerning what spirit is at work at that particular time. And the spirit that can be at work is the human spirit, the Holy Spirit, or a demonic spirit. So when you're talking to somebody, you can discern what spirit is at work in that individual. Amen. And these things are developed in your life. Amen. As you grow uh, in internally the Christian. But secondly, there is expansion growth. The church would multiply in Jerusalem. So at different points in time, we see where the church moved uh, from like 5,000 were added and 3,000 were added and so on. So there was expansion growth. It starts with 120. Then by the end of that message, there were 3,000. Amen. Then we realize that later on, this amount of souls were saved and that it was an increase, a multiplication in Jerusalem. But God's intention is not for the church to grow in one location. God's intention is for the church to grow to an extension growth. So the church did not stop at Jerusalem and, and, and I like how God did it. There is a belief by some theologians that what God did was cause persecution to come upon the church. Amen. So some persecutions are not bad because what it did, it allowed the church to scatter. Amen. So now they were in Jerusalem. They were okay. The apostles were there. There was they were, they were happy. People would come to Jerusalem and talk to the apostles, whoever they need to be. But there was no outgoing. So all of a sudden, Rome started to get crazy and decided to come against the church. I mean, it looked like a bad thing, but nothing bad can happen to the child of God. God knows what he's doing. So the persecution caused the people to scatter. And the church would extend and plant new churches in other similar cultures, like Judea first. Now note it says Judea because Judea would be a part of the of of, of the the whole um, Jewish system. Remember you had Judea, uh, which was today. If I can remember, Judea was today the south, amen. And 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 Galilee was to the north, and then Samaria was in the middle. If my mind serves me right in relation to the, the the map, amen. So first it started with Judea, and then go on to say onto Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, which is the bridging growth. Now it goes to Samaria, which we know is a culture that was mixed with part Jews and part Gentiles. The Jews never considered them to be nothing. We know that scripture carefully from St. John 4. Jews never considered them at all. Amen. So the growth now was bridging the culture of the Jews, now going to the Samarians and also to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we find like the church at Antioch, amen, which in about Acts chapter 11. And we find that they, from Antioch, the mission work started and so on. So we see the role of the Holy Ghost in the church. Now, the Holy Spirit is the director of mission-driven church. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit is the director of a mission-driven church. Now, let us look at some examples from scripture. In Acts chapter 8, remember that Philip, uh, after they had the, the whole persecution and Philip went down um, to Judea and, and, and so on and so forth. Remember what happened when he, when he booked up on the Ethiopian eunuch. One of the things that the Bible said, and the Bible said, then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to the chariot. Know what happened? The spirit said it. Not that Philip uh, of himself decided that he was going to go to this Ethiopian eunuch. Amen. But the spirit was what directed Philip to go and to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. What am I saying? Is that we are supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. I mean, it is the Spirit of God that is going to enable us to move and to who we should go to and when we should go to that person. I strongly believe there probably could have been other people nearby. I strongly believe whatever the case, but God, through the Spirit, led Philip and told him what he should do. And he was able to accomplish a great work, baptize the Ethiopian. And we know the, the, the scripture carefully. Then the Holy Ghost took him away. Amen. And here it is that they, they just believe that this is where they, this, the gospel message was now pushed into Ethiopia, which is Africa. All right. Example number two. I like this one because in Acts chapter 16, and let me stop here for a bit. We find that in Acts chapter, uh, up to about Acts chapter 14, um, we find that Paul went on is what is called the first missionary journey. Now, the first missionary journey started about Acts chapter 13, and it goes to Acts chapter 
14. Now in Acts chapter 15, we find that something happened. There was a dispute, if you can remember, between Paul and Barnabas over Mark John. And if you can remember what happened with Mark John, Mark John turned back because uh, mission work is not an easy thing, brethren. And therefore, by the time Mark John reached, I think it was Phrygia or something like that, he decided to turn back. And, and, and when they were going to go on the second missionary journey, which is Acts chapter 16, um, um, Paul decided that he was not going to take Mark John with him. And therefore, um, we realized that there was a big problem. Um, so, 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 so Barnabas said, okay, if you're not going to take him with me, I will take him. So there was a big split. Paul took uh, Silas and Barnabas put Mark John. I strongly believe that this was all orchestrated by God because at the end of the day, we realized that Mark John and, 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 and Barnabas went another area to do mission work. So the, no, the mission work was split in two. It seemed like the devil meant it for evil, but God all worked it out. But the point I'm trying to make now is that Paul was about to begin his second missionary journey. Now in Acts chapter 15, the Bible said he, he, did, he did some work first. From, in, when you look in chapter 15, he did some work. He was straight in the church in the region of, I think it was Syria and Cilicia. So he was now straightening the work that he had done from the first missionary journey in Acts chapter, from Acts chapter 13 to 14. So it's a normal thing for when you do mission work, for you to go back and to straighten the work. I remember when we went to Kenya in 2014, amen, we went there and we went, we would plan church, we would preach, we would do what we need to do. But when we went back in 2016, the aim was different. The aim was not to, to do so much preaching. The aim was to go back and to visit back these churches. Amen. All of these churches we were all over the place, driving both in Kenya and Tanzania to strengthen by the churches, to do teaching and to teach people about the gospel. So in a similar way, Paul wanted to go back uh, into these regions. He, he started already in, by going to Syria and to Cilicia. Actually, in Acts chapter 16 also, we find where Paul, it was first time we see Paul coming to Timothy. And if you know anything about Timothy, Timothy had uh, was a Greek man. He, he had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. And Paul wanted to take him with him. So what Paul did was circumcise him. All right. So now this is the first time we are booking up now this Timothy. Um, and we also see that um, Luke was with him. Luke had to say, boy, and, and we were going, to, we were wanted to go to this particular place and this happened. So the plan of Paul was to strengthen the church in the region and to go to the southwest towards um, Ephesus. That was his aim. He wanted to do his plan. Pa Paul, and obviously what he wanted to do was sounded like something good. But look at the scripture in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, 7, and 10. It says, no, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost. Now, when I read this, we say, this, this kind of, had me thinking. They wanted to go. Note, you know, Paul established your first missionary journey. No, he wanted to go back and straight the work that he had done. But the Holy Ghost forbid him. The Holy Ghost, you know. So he was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach in Asia. And after that, they were come to Mysia and are said to go to Britain. But the Spirit suffered them not. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. I surely gathered that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now I want you to understand something. We note with interest that the Holy Spirit actually forbade Paul to do something we normally think as something good. So preaching God's word to those who are in need is something good. We must preach the word. But guess what I said before? A mission-driven church must be led by the Spirit of God. So it is while we want to do things for God, it must be the spirit of God that directs the work. If that's not the case, then we're we are not going to get the results that we want. So guess what happened now? When Paul decided to obey the Holy Ghost, we realized that some powerful things happened because now when he went over to, to Macedonia, it was in this region that he was able to, to witness, to, to establish the church at Corinth. It was at this region that he established a church at Thessalonica. So even though in his third missionary journey, he was able to go back to the places that he established from his first missionary journey because he's led by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Ghost is the one that directs the work. A lot of us, amen, sometimes are not as 
fruitful as we should be because we have a strong desire to do the things of God, but we are not being led by the Spirit of God. And therefore, while God is saying go here, because we know it is good to preach, amen, we might go to a convention and God, and God say, I want to preach on the fruit of the Spirit. But the theme of the convention is war. But we, because we're not being led by the Spirit of God, amen, we say, no, let us just follow the program. I'm not saying we should go, go against the program, you know. But I'm saying that at the end of the day, we should allow the Spirit of God to lead us because that is where we're going to get the most fruit of what God's desire. Remember, you know, the mission-driven church is led always by the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost. He determines what we do, when we do it, how we do it, where we do it. Praise God. And therefore, we see where Paul wanted to go to uh, to preach the word of God in Asia. But it's preach the word, you know. He wanted to preach the word. No, the man never wanted to go to Igor. The man never wanted a vacation. The man wanted to go and preach the word. But the Holy Ghost forbade him. The Holy Ghost stopped him. The Holy Ghost said, you're not going to go there right now. I know you want to do this, but follow my yes. My yes is that right now you're going to go to Macedonia. What am I saying? A mission-driven church must be led by the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 13 also, we see where the Bible said, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, this is what we need in this season, for the Holy Ghost to say, Amen. Separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work where to have called them. So they've been sent forth by what? The Holy Ghost. Departing from Seleucia and from then they sailed to Cyprus. This is talking about the going on the first missionary journey from Antioch. What am I saying? The scripture make it clear that it was not Paul and Barnabas or Barnabas and Saul who decided that we are going to go on a mission. The Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. The Holy Ghost said, did this. The Holy Ghost says, go to Stony Hill Square. The Holy Ghost says, establish a church in Dwayne Park. The Holy Ghost says, the Holy Ghost says, amen. When we obey the voice of the Holy Ghost, and this is what we need in this season. We need people who are going to be praying and fasting and allowing the Holy Ghost to speak because the mission driven church is led by the Holy Ghost. So what we see in Acts chapter 13, verse two to four, we notice two things as we relate to the Holy Ghost and the mission of church. The Holy Ghost guides the decisions. So we see that in Acts 15, uh, verse 28, where it's the Holy Ghost that will guide your decisions. Amen. Also, it is the Holy Ghost, praise God, that will actually select the ministers. Praise God. So in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it is the Holy Ghost church. It is not your church. It is not my church, but it's the Holy Ghost church. And therefore, because this is his church, he decides what to do. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says this, praise God. Acts 20, 20 verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flocks over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers. So just like how God directs the church, it is the Holy Ghost who had made you an overseer. It is the Holy Ghost who makes you a minister. It is the Holy Ghost who makes you a choir member. It is the Holy Ghost. And if it is the Holy Ghost who had placed you there, then you're going to be most effective there. When you operate in a, in a position where the Holy Ghost has not placed you, that's where your problem comes in. That is why the mission-driven church must understand that it's the Holy Spirit, praise God, that is guiding the work. It's the Holy Spirit that is leading the church. It's the Holy Ghost that guides the decision. It's the Holy Ghost that selects the ministers. Now, how can we be guided by the Holy Ghost? Prayer is coupled with missions. Prayer is coupled with missions. It is through prayer that the mission-driven church is led by the Spirit of God. When we pray, we will see results. When we pray, we will see results. I strongly believe that we are not seeing results because one, we're not being led by the Spirit of God as we should. But secondly, we're not being led by the Spirit of God because we don't pray as we should. So in Acts chapter 2, the Bible made it clear from, the, from Luke to about Acts chapter 2, it's about 10 days. For 10 days, they carried in Jerusalem and they prayed. 
Peter preached for 10 minutes and 3,000 souls were saved. Today, we pray for 10 minutes, pray for 10 days, and only get few saved. It bothers me, brethren. Let me it again. In Acts chapter 2, they prayed for 10 days, prayed for 10 minutes, and 3,000 souls were saved. But today, we are so worked up that we, and we, we, we have all the, 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 the preaching art to the T. We know how to, to put it nicely and to, to do what. So we only pray for 10 minutes. We have a crusade for 10 days and only a few people get saved. I don't know if it bothers you, but it bothers me. And it tells me a principle. If we pray more, we will win more. If we pray more, we will win more. In this season, brethren, it is time for us to put first things first. What is first? Our relationship with God, internal growth, our prayer life. When we're in tune with God, where we're in tune with the Holy Ghost, then we can only speak one word and it's more effective than a whole sermon. No, nothing's wrong with sermon. Nothing's wrong with preparation. I, 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 I'm, I'm a, I love preparation. I, I, I think that as children of God, we are supposed to be prepared and organized. But we must realize that, Mr. Before, the mission-driven church must be led by the Holy Ghost. And we can only be led by the Holy Ghost when we pray and understand the mission. Prayer must precede all plans for mission. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, verse 1 to 24, Jesus tells his disciples to pray in verse 2. Then he tell them to go in verse 3. Let me say that. He said, pray in verse 2. And then in verse 3, he said, go. Look at the verse. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, not the first command, the Lord of the harvest, that he should send forth laborers into the harvest. Then go on to say, go your way. Behold, I sent you forth as lambs before wolves. As children of God, we are supposed to pray, then we go. Not go and then we pray. Pray and then we go. Because we might want to go and the Holy Spirit will forbid us and say, don't go tonight or next week. We must be led by the Spirit of God. They that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Now, as a mission-driven church, what do we pray about? We pray for laborers. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. Pray, brethren, for those who have, of us who have a burden for souls, for those of us who have a burden for growth in the kingdom of God, we have to pray for souls. We have to pray that God will do a work in this season. Pray for souls. Praise God. What do we pray for? We pray that the gospel have free course. Second Thessalonians chapter, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse one to two. It says this. Finally, brethren, and this is Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. This is the apostle Paul, the great apostle Paul, the man who, as I said before, went on three missionary journeys. The man who who decided, look here, he caught himself as nothing that he might win Christ, but he never underestimated the power of prayer and mission. He said, finally, brethren, pray for us. That the word of the Lord may have free course, my God, and be glorified even as it is with you. And that he may be delivered from all unreasonable and wicked men, for all have not faith. So when we pray, we're going to pray that we have free course. It means that the gospel message will run swiftly. We run, uh, we advance as we declare the word. Not only that, we must pray for free course. We must also pray for opportunity. Amen. So the Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, praise God, and verse 3, it says, praise God, that we all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. So here it is that he's saying that, look here, he's not just praying that God will have free course, but he's saying, God, create an opportunity that I can declare the word. Put somebody in my path, God. Somebody who needs to hear the word. Somebody who needs to hear something from you. Create that opportunity. So we're praying for laborers. We're praying that the gospel will have free course. We're praying for an opportunity. We're also praying for boldness. So Paul writes to the church, uh, praise God, in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9. And he's saying that we must pray that we might have 
boldness to declare the word of God. Amen. I pray, God, that we will come to a place where we will have boldness to declare the word of God to everybody. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9. Praise God. Paul prayed and he was asking the church to pray that you will have boldness. Amen. In declaring the word of God in this season. I pray, God, that we will have boldness. Amen. As we go to the pulpit and declare the word to everybody. Now, tonight, we're going to look at who the messengers are. Because there is a misconception that the messenger of the gospel are the ministers. And when I say the ministers, I'm talking about the, 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 the evangelists and the pastors. Amen. And those who do who, who are in leadership position. But that is far from the truth. Amen. The missing the messengers of the gospel in a mission driven church is every single person, every born again believer. If you receive the Holy Ghost, if you are baptized in Jesus' name, amen, then guess what? You are a messenger of the gospel. So God's method is for every saint to be a witness. We saw this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come, you shall be what? Witnesses unto me. So you're, all of us are witnesses of the gospel. So in a court of law, a witness is one who testifies about something or someone. So as a witness, you are to testify, brethren, about Jesus and his plan for the salvation of all mankind. Who does that? Not just the pastor. Who does that? Not just the evangelist. Who does that? Not just the, the preacher or the teacher. Each and every one of us are supposed to be witnesses. And there are two kinds of witnesses. There are, there are those that uh, testify verbal witness about a subject and, there are that, that, and, and those who prove, um, what we call visible proof about a subject. So the Holy Spirit helps us to be a witness to the gospel both verbally and through visible demonstration of God's power. So as a witness, we are to tell what we have seen. As a witness, we are to tell what we have heard. As a witness, we are to tell what we have experienced. Amen. And, and who you do that to? Every who can do that? Everybody. Did you get the Holy Ghost? Yes, you did. Were you baptized in Jesus' name? Yes, you did. When you got the Holy Ghost, was it joy and speakable and full of glory? Yes, it was. When you got the Holy Ghost, did it change your life? Yes, it did. So guess what? You are a witness. And as a witness, you are to tell everybody what you have seen. What did you see? You see your life change. What do you see? You see God doing a work in your life. You're seeing that irrespective of the fact that there is a storm in your life. Amen. Storms are coming. There is an inner peace that comes with the fact that you have God in your life. What have you heard? You have heard the good news. You have heard that the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it saves lives just like it did in the first century. What have you experienced? You have experienced joy. What have you experienced? You have experienced love. What have you experienced? You have experienced peace. You have experienced long suffering. You have experienced the presence of Almighty God. Therefore, the fact that you have done this, you are a witness. You can tell somebody about this gospel message. As if for every person who is baptized, praise God, in Jesus' name. Every person who has received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, praise God, must be involved in spreading the gospel message because you are a witness. In Acts, the apostles gave themselves full time, and we know that, to the studying of the word and to prayer. Amen. We saw where the apostles, they couldn't get involved in the, the, the normal affairs. Amen. It kind of was a distraction. So what they did, they appointed some men, amen, to perform other duties, to look after the ministering of the widows and, and tasks of serving and so on. But did this exclude them from being witnesses? No, it didn't. And we see that example. For example, we find Stephen, who was one of the deacons chosen for the serving task. Yet he bore a powerful witness of the gospel. In Acts chapter 6, we see where Stephen did some powerful things. Amen. And to the point where he was preaching so hard that the people stoned him. Amen. Because the man decided that he was going to declare. Stephen, you know, one of the first martyrs of the church, was not one of the apostles, was not one of the twelve. He was just a normal person who served. What am I saying to you, brethren? Is that you don't have to have a big position. Amen. You don't need any title at all. What you need is just to be a witness of what you have seen, what you have heard, and what you have experienced. You see, Philip was also one of the other deacons. He was chosen to serve, but he shared the gospel with the Samaritans. He was one of the first guys who went down there. I remember he set back for the apostles, I think it was Peter and John, who came down, who laid hands on the people, and they received the Holy Ghost. But guess what? 
Philip decided, not because I'm not one of the apostles who had given myself totally to studying the word and prayer, means that I should not be a witness. Some of us, uh, we're not in full-time ministry. Amen. We got to work. But it, at the same time, praise God, we are still should be witnesses of this message. So when persecution came to Jerusalem and believers scattered in all cities, everyone continued to be witnesses of the gospel. Acts 8 verse 4 said, Therefore, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the gospel. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Who are they? The people, everybody, the young children, the bigger children, the old people, the women, the men. And my plan next week, one of the things I'm going to be looking at as it relates to the mission-driven church is one of the role of the women. There is a thing going about nowadays where women have been placed as as in a, in a position where they are not allowed to declare the word. And we look at Timothy where he said the woman should be silent. What does this mean? Amen. We're going to try to look at this. And why did Paul write this to Ephesus especially? We're going to try to examine some of this, the role of the woman in the church and the mission-driven church. We're going to look at the structure of the church. But what am I saying is that every person, every person, male, female, boy, girl, amen, every person, they were, every person that was scattered abroad after the persecution went about and they preach the word. Every child of God is called to be a witness of God who has brought them out of spiritual darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Now the message of the gospel is not based on your education. It's not based on your gender. It's not based on your natural ability. These things don't exclude you from becoming a witness. You know, some of the, some of, some of the powerful men that we read about um, in, 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 in our apostolic history, Jamaican apostolic history. Some of them were not very educated. Uh, people who have been saved from way back can tell you that a lot of people looked down on the apostolic church. They were saying, boy, them people are never bright. But when these people preach with their red dirt, amen, and their, 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 the ground was, was, was not shiny and pretty. They never had a whole of fancy instruments. They never had fancy keyboard and piano. They had probably tambourine, amen. And, but guess what? When they preach, People got saved. Thousands of people got saved. The gospel was spreading like wildfire. You know why? One, they relied on the Holy Ghost. Two, they had a prayerful life. And three, they realized that, look here, it's not about being educated. It's about God using you in this season. So it's not based on your education. It's not based on your gender. It's not based on your natural ability. God uses everyone and anyone as he please. So that at, at the end of the day, when he uses you, he gets the glory. It's the glory is not about how educated I am. The glory is not how much things you know. The, the glory is he is the joy. That's why I'm saying Paul water, our Paul plant, another water, but it is God who does the increase. Amen. As a mission-driven church, must understand that each and every one of us are called to be messengers. So here it is that Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says, for he see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And, and there's a reason why he wrote this because the, the church at Corinth had a problem. They were very much influenced by the Greek culture. And that's why there was a, even an issue with some being for Paul and some being for Apollos. Apollos is said to come from the, the, Alex, the church of Alexandria, you know, the, 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 the eloquent speaker. Amen. As opposed to Paul, who decided that he was not going to come with the enticing words of men, wisdom. And both are needed, you know. Don't get me wrong. Because you have some preachers who are very excellent in how they speak and they come across. And that's their personality. Nothing is wrong with that. But Paul realized that when he took that approach, amen, he didn't have a lot of converts. Actually, before he went to Corinth, he was at Athens. And in Athens, he didn't have a lot of converts. So when he went to Corinth, he brought a simple message of Christ being crucified. Uh, the message of Christ and him being crucified. So, so Paul had to say to them, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised that God chosen, yea. And things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. What am I saying, brethren? You're calling to do mission. You're calling as a mission-driven church. It's not based on your education. It's not based on how strong you are. It's not based on your strength. It's not based on, 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 on all of these things. What it's based on is Christ. Amen. 
I'm going to close off with this particular passage. It says, for this he said, for this is he that had spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Let me explain this. In order to understand what was taking place in this particular verse, we have to, under, we have to go back to how the roads were established during that time. So, you know, they had very part, they had, you know, like you had, when they go country, you have like a path road that goes through the bushes. They have a lot of path roads that would lead to main roads that would eventually lead to paved roads. Um, and these, the paved roads were mainly in the city, but the paths were on the outer, outer side of the city. So it was, it was kind of difficult um, to traverse these paths. I mean, some, a lot of times people got lost because they had this rubber path going all over the place. Amen. And there was no much sign. Um, so it was easy for people to get lost. Now, Jesus made a very important statement in St. John 14, 16. says, I am the way. Now, the word way there um, is from a Greek word, hodos, and it means path. So here it is that Jesus is saying that, look here, all the paths at the end of the day, it is easy for people to get lost. But in order for you to find your way to where you're going, choose this road. I am the road. That's what he's saying. I am the road that will lead you to where you need to go. So the first thing about the mission driven church is that we understand that the only way to get people to where they're supposed to go in God is to go through Jesus Christ. He is the way. Now here's the cry that comes out of the book of Isaiah. In the wilderness, prepare the road of the Lord. That's what the scripture is saying. So it is said that whenever a king or an important official was to pass through an era, some things would have taken place. So whenever, you, as I said before, imagine these, these, these little path roads, amen, they were easy to get lost on these roads, but Jesus is declaring, not look here, you don't need to get lost. I am the road that will lead you there. Now, whenever a king or, a, or, or an official or, or was about to come into an area, the people would do a couple of things. A messenger would run ahead of the king into the local farms and villages. So he would run ahead of the king and he would shout, the king is coming. Go out and make ready the road. Not because of these roads were a little part. They were, they just said that some of the roads had a lot of rocks in them. Um, they had a lot of debris. Whereas if you never walk in the road uh, for a little time, it had probably get, it wasn't clear as it should be. So what would have happened? All the people that were in the town, because the king was coming. It's like when the queen would come to uh, Jamaica recently or, or when Obama came here. We saw where they, 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 some people went ahead and they fix the road. They know everywhere where this king is going to walk. And they would fix the road to ensure that when he travels on that particular road, it is clear. So what the people would do, they would take out any rock that was on the road. They would cut back the hanging branches. They would fill in the areas that was washed out. They removed any obstacle that was in the road. What were the people doing? The people were making the road ready. Now, what, who do those people represent? That people represent each and every one of us in the kingdom. Our role, brethren, is to make the road ready for the king. Who is the king? Jesus. Jesus is coming. And there is a cry that the king is coming. There is a cry to this dying world. The mission-driven church understands that the message that is going out there is that the king is coming. What is our duty? Each and every one of us, not just the ministers, but every person, our duty is to make the road ready. How do we make the road ready? By declaring the gospel, by removing the, 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 the stones and the debris, by making people ready to, for the King Jesus to come. The cry is still going on today. God's road on earth still needs to be prepared. And you and I should do our best to prepare the way for our King. What am I saying? As a mission-driven church, we have a mandate. Not just Bishop Brown. Not just Bishop Daly, not just Elder this, not just Minister that, but each and every one of us, there is a cry that the King is coming. And our responsibility is to make the road ready for the King. How do we make the road ready? Ready by going out there and declaring the gospel message to each and every person that the, road, that the King is coming so that we can prepare the road for him. In closing, the mission of the church is summarized as follows. The church is to present Jesus Christ to the world as Lord and Savior. That's our responsibility. 
The church is to establish believers in apostolic doctrine, in principles and practice of Christian living. That's discipleship. The goal of the church is to spread the gospel to the world. We are preparing the road. But today, the mission-driven church, we are, to, we are to be served as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's our mission. We are not supposed to be like everybody else. What's the mission-driven church? We are to disciple new converts. I'm saying as a mission-driven church, brethren, we have a great task ahead of us. And I pray, God, that tonight that somebody was enthused and ready to prepare the road for the Lord. Somebody is ready to be led by the Holy Spirit. Somebody is ready to increase their prayer life and to ensure that God is the one who moves us to do whatever we do. Where do we go next week? We're going to continue with who does mission. We're going to continue with the structure of the mission in the local church. Can I tell you? In our local church, God is a God of order. We can set up things that are going to use uh, the diagram from, from, from my assembly in, in relation to how we set up our mission department to show an example of how we can organize because each and every one of us in the kingdom, there is a purpose for us. Amen. Some of us can teach, but some of us can go out on the road and we, we can't do the, the long teaching, but we can tell somebody the gospel message. And when that gospel message is passed, when we do the Acts 2020 work, which is host to host, then we can practically move it on to a home Bible study teacher. We can see a structure where the hand can work with the foot and the eye can work with the ears and each one of us combine together so that we have a powerful mission-driven church. We can look at the role of women. We can look at the structure of the church and some other little things as we close, as it were, this mission-driven church and its purpose today. God bless you. And I pray, God, that we have learned something and we have been enlightened by something. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name.